Hello to all. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Sanders. I'm a managing director at Results Healthcare. I'd hope that most of you know pretty well and know what we do, but in case not, Results Healthcare is a leading sector specialist, mid-market advisory firm to clients um, in private equity uh, and business owners, um, working from offices in London and New York. Um, our discussion today really revolves around um, what's next for private equity investment in healthcare. We spend a lot of our time in one-to-one -one meetings, um, virtual meetings with clients and with business owners uh, to discuss what they're seeing now, what they see coming, and indeed advising clients about what they should be doing and think about to make the most of the opportunities as the lockdown eases. Um, what we wanted to do today is to broaden that into a wider forum. So to give our network a chance to hear um, these perspectives. This is our first webinar, but it's very much part of an ongoing campaign. Um, we want to have a positive impact on every individual and every firm that we work with. So over recent months, we have maintained a steady stream of content and events that are focused on helping you to succeed in the current climate. So I hope that you find this webinar valuable. I'm joined today by three senior healthcare investors. Um, firstly, Jane Gruer is an operating partner at Limerston Capital. Um, they're a private equity firm with over 300 million pounds under management. Over half the current fund is invested in, in healthcare and in life sciences, and they continue to invest in the sector. Jane actually started her career as a qualified doctor in the NHS and has also worked in the pharma and life sciences practice at McKinsey. I'm also joined by Ben Long, a partner at Inflection. Um, they're a mid-market private equity firm investing in high growth entrepreneurial businesses across all sectors from offices in London and Manchester. Ben's been in private equity since 2006 and has specialized in healthcare for almost 10 years, leading investments into businesses including Pharma Spectra, European Life Care Group and Lint Bells. And I'm delighted to welcome Kevin Keck. Kevin's a partner at Phoenix Equity Partners, who are a leading growth-focused private equity firm, investing in UK private companies valued at up to £150 million. Kevin leads Phoenix's investment in the healthcare, education and media sectors and is a non-exec director at Rainer Surgical Group, Signature Discovery and 19 events. But we are an international firm. We wanted to ensure that you get an international perspective. So to help with that, I am joined by Pierre-Georges Roy from our US team. Pierre, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, David. Good, good afternoon, everyone. So I sit 20 miles more north of New York City today, and I was on Wall Street where our office is. I was telling our uh, panel participants that uh, Things are fairly looking are looking fairly normal uh, in the financial district. I was able to buy food to say hello to the security guard in our uh, building and to meet some neighbors. So um, don't believe everything you read in the press and carry on. So I um, I am um, responsible for the healthcare business in the United States of Results Healthcare. Our uh, focus sectors targets. Um, owner-operated and venture-backed uh, entities that operate at the uh, convergence of technology and healthcare. So I was looking at our uh, live deals that are in process right now, just to give you a sense. We're working on a roughly $100 million transaction, which is a medical education online um, SaaS platform that we're selling out of the Midwest to a, a European corporate. Uh, closing is imminent. We are working on a uh, RPA, which is a robotics process automation uh, systems integrator uh, that is selling itself to probably a private equity firm in the next uh, two, three months. And um, so this business helps uh, health payers and health systems essentially uh, upgrade their software packages remotely. So very much in, de in demand in this COVID time. And thirdly, we are doing one of the, um, we're helping the owners of one of the largest uh, healthcare communications and uh, medical science uh, vulgar vulgarization, if you want, uh, agencies in the United States uh, find a partner. I will note a couple of things. About 80% of our deals are cross-border, and we're very focused on the very on the uh, busy transatlantic corridor. So a lot of our counterparties to our deals 
uh, sit normally in London or in Munich or in Paris. And uh, a lot of our uh, targets have um, uh, a desire to sort of uh, look outside the four corners of the United States for their strategic partner or financial partner. So uh, hopefully that gives you a good overview. We're uh, happy to answer other questions. Thanks, Pierre. So that's the preamble. Um, I wanted to kick off the discussion, if I may, please, by testing the mood a bit. So I guess um, a very good game has been talked since the very start of the lockdown, actually, um, with clients that we've spoken to. Everyone's saying that they're open for business. How real is that? Um, and I'd, I'd love a perspective from each of you on this, but um, Jane, perhaps if I start with you on this one. Um, yeah, I mean, as you said, we are very much open for business. And I think kind of, um, healthcare has been you know, and remains a very good sector to be investing in in the downturn. Um, obviously, the, the different parts of healthcare have been impacted differently. You've seen delays in new trials starting um, and obviously elective surgery uh, businesses have had challenges. But at the end of the day, you know, demand remains for those products. And when you have a good product, you have a good service, um, good business with good cash generation and downside protection, I think this, the interest is still very much there. Um, so yeah, very much open for business. Ben, is that a picture that you recognize? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say, so we're, we're hopefully touching a lot of wood about two to three weeks off closing a deal at the moment in the healthcare space. Um, so we are, kind of genuinely still invest in capital. Um, I think uh, the challenge will probably lie in building relationships with new management teams and founders, which is really at the core of what Inflection does. 75, 80% of our investments involve founders in some way, shape or form. And so I think depending on how long we're homebound, um, the question is sort of how you build those relationships virtually because obviously you're coming from a position of mutual trust when you when you agree a deal so um i i i think our current work in progress will be fine to continue investing over the next couple of months but building those new relationships is where we need to think about changing the way we do business a bit thanks definitely keen to explore that theme of some of the practical obstacles around deal making um but perhaps before we do that kevin um do you think funds are going to be pushing forward aggressively as lockdown restrictions ease i i think that there will be um uh, definitely a desire to make new investments as we look forward to the, through the rest of this year and um you know we definitely would like to be making new investments as we look forward through the rest of 2020 uh, and I think within that, you know, healthcare will be a particularly um, busy sector, actually, for lots of reasons that Nanette will come on to talk about. But uh, a combination of resilience, sort of importance of the sector and growth, I think, mean it will be a busy, um, busy area. Okay, thanks. Sounds positive. Um, Pierre, how do things look like on the other side of the Atlantic? It, it sounded from your recent experience on Wall Street that um, we're very much moving past the lockdown phase. I think so. I think, um, again, I speak from uh, our, uh, our professional business uh, activities and uh, I, I don't read the news every day. So just uh, to tell you what I see and what I'm doing, we probably, uh, excuse me, we probably talk to five to 10 investors a week uh, in our group because a lot of people are reaching out to us looking for deal flow. A lot of our prospect clients know that they have to reissue forecasts and give a, an update on how their business is either thriving, suffering, or uh, has limited impact from the pandemic. And I have seen the whole gamut. I've seen some significant pickup in um, performance of some of the prospects we're working with. I have seen some where the wheels have completely come off the bus and I've seen uh, companies go steady and not uh, show too much um, negative or positive impact from, uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. So from the uh, private equity side, we are told by a number of mid-market private equity investors that there are 
very keen on meeting with uh, performing targets, obviously. I think uh, vendor or sellers are uh, by and large intrigued perhaps more than before with the notion of partnering with a financial partner because they happen to know that some of their peers or competitors could be picked up at a reasonable to attractive valuation. So they see themselves as a potential platform. And so whereas before a lot of people were more interested in talking to some differentiated strategic, I think now that we are um, looking at who is emerging as a strong contender to perform well in this uh, pandemic or distancing era, uh, I think owner operators uh, fancy themselves as being a good uh, uh, operating partner for a, for a private equity capital. So it's, it's anecdotal at this stage, but I expect it to be more of a trend in the next couple of months. Thanks, and we, we touched on the topic of um, the um, practical difficulties to deploying capital when lockdown restrictions are in place. Um, Jane, have you seen any innovation around this um, during the, the weeks of the lockdown? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I'd love to hear other, everyone else's kind of input on this too. Um, you know, we've obviously, like everyone else, been doing a lot more VCs um, with management teams, um, which, you know, to Ben's point, it starts to try and build a relationship, but you're still, you know, a gazillion miles away and there's still, um, you're not physically with the person. So it's not, it's, you know, it's not as perfect as it could be, but it's, 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 it's a step forward. Um, we've done a couple of kind of um, just using your iPhone kind of iPhone walkthroughs of sites. Um, again, it's not a, it's not the same as being able to just have a chat with the goods in person as the you know the receiving um, area of a lab to say actually it's been a pretty quiet month or it's been super busy etc. Um, but it gives you a bit of a sense of the business that you're that you're chatting with and. Um, and so, sense of really how it kind of all all lays out um, has has it been a way of keeping prospects alive and, and moving towards the finish line rather than something that is allowed you to actually transact it's a yeah it's a good 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 question i think you know, transactions definitely are taking longer so i'd say our our engagement with management teams has been strung out over a longer period and part of that's just the practicalities of founders who are dealing with childcare during the day and um, you know, and, and kind of cramming these into kind of late afternoon or late evening even um, discussions, and so kind of being flexible and being able to kind of adapt to that um, and understand has been crucial. Um, I think, yeah, it's we we completed a transaction literally just as lockdown happened, um, which was which was great um and required kind of slightly more innovation around digital signing etc um but um we have not yet completed a transaction in kind of you know that we started in um mm -hmm. in lockdown it's definitely taking longer um but i think everyone else is probably in the same boat um so um yeah. kevin how about you have you seen any um due diligence done by drone camera i i haven't no i have to say and i, I think you know uh, the, the, the only obstacles at the moment, despite your checking with previous call, is the incessant drilling that started across the road at 3.03. My daughter, who is taking a homeschooling exam about five yards away, and told me to keep the door closed so I don't disturb her. And therefore, the room in the attic, which is constantly heating up sort of by the minute right now. So besides that, I think actually there's a way of doing these things remotely, actually. And you can definitely um, look at lots of things remotely. I, I agree with the comments that uh, both Jane and Ben have made already, which is the most difficult piece, I think, is actually moving beyond a sort of catch up and actually, you know, building a rapport with teams that you'd like to work with in the future. Um, there's so far that you can go remotely, but it's not the same as being able to be in the same room or, you know, particularly something more socially with, with, with people. Yeah. Yeah. And what's your experience been? Uh, yeah, pretty similar. So we, I mean, the transaction we're doing at the moment is with a US seller, um, so it was kind of be going to be always going to be pretty remote. Um, and uh, and I think I'm I'm very hopeful that we've spent enough time investing in building relationships in the healthcare space in the mid market over the last two years that there's enough there that actually we already you know we've already met we already have a feel for each other. 
we make sure we you know try and regularly check in with the key priority relationships that we're building um to a certain extent there's a little bit of it, kind of the, what kevin was referring to with uh, his tropical attic space and and children and stuff like that we've there's actually a little bit more in common that we all have i think now um in many cases so that that can be helpful um but it you know don't we've not yet got to the point where um uh you know we you know we've we've done a, a sort of transaction start to finish never met before all the way through to closing but at the same time you know they, these things take take a while so uh, i would have thought even with the stuff that's at the earlier stage there's time for us to kind of come out and lock down hopefully meet perhaps remotely and one at a time in the park or whatever the, whatever the rule is at the moment mm -hmm. um and uh and so we'll, the investing will continue and as jane said earlier the fundamentals are so good um, for the healthcare space, that that we, it's not it's not an area where we can see it doing anything other than increase. So then, as we move from the phase where we're emerging from lockdown into a new equilibrium, um, you know, pre or post vaccine, I think it's hopefully already apparent that we can see some winners and losers of that lockdown phase. Um, how about when the lockdown's behind us? Kevin, do you have a sense yet for um, where you might particularly be looking for opportunity, opportunity um, when we're we're past the immediate post-lockdown phase? It's a good question. I think there'll be a number of areas that will benefit um, in the short, in the, through the medium term, I'd say, uh, and there will be different impacts. I think Pierre as was saying earlier, sort of in the short term. Um, you know, we, we continue to see a lot of activity and obviously have an existing investment in the pharma services sector. You know, that's an area that um, not just through our own investments, but in terms of transactions still that have been happening. That is the area I think that's been busiest uh, in the last couple few months. You know, you still have seen a number of transactions happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have an existing investment in the medical devices world as well. We'll continue to focus there. And then interestingly, we can be interested to hear others' thoughts on it. But you know, we're spending some time thinking about whether there might be opportunities in the medium term, again, where uh, services that might have been provided publicly, historically, might increasingly be provided privately, and whether there'll be businesses that benefit from, from that in the medium term. So, but I think across the board, there'll be some interesting opportunities in my sense. Ben, how do you see things? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, um, uh, I, I think that um lockdown will probably accelerate a few changes that were already in play like around adaptive trials or um, remote patient monitoring that sort of stuff i can also see um an environment where that seriously favors smaller players um, because there are a couple of examples where, because of the nature of the industry, one of the reasons it's interesting is it, it, regulation and, and practice changes quite slowly in life sciences and in medical devices in particular. And uh, this kind of acceleration of change, I think, will catch a lot of the incumbents unawares, which is good for the smaller players that are already either at the forefront or able to flex their business models. Um, and uh, I think you'll see that in um med devices uh adaptive trials um there'll be a, a whole load a whole load more use of technology which leads to a whole load more production of data um who collates that data who manipulates that data who can understand that data what does that mean for medical affairs agencies what's their role in that i think that i think the acceleration of some of those very slow changes that were happening and will probably favour smaller, smaller firms and shake up some of the, the kind of almost oligopolies that have developed in the sector. Yep. Um, and I guess one of the subsectors that we've seen you know, before our eyes be transformed is, is digital health, um, where I think the landscape is um, still emergent, but it, it does feel like quite a lot of cultural barriers and, and perhaps even regulatory barriers have been overcome through pressure of circumstances during the lockdown. Um, Jane, I imagine you must have a quite unique perspective on this as a, a former medic. 
Um, do you think some of these changes are, are going to be permanent in nature? Do, do you see that as a, an area of opportunity? It's a really interesting question. And, and yes, um, so I think what you've seen, as you say, is kind of an overnight change in, in adoption of these technologies that previously were really hard to both get physicians to sign up to, but also consumers. Um, and overnight, they've been forced to, to make the change and actually realise that they're not that bad after all. Um, right now, you've got um, a number of technologies that kind of have, have been adopted and the question will be which ones survive um, into, into long term. But I think until there's a vaccine found, you actually have a decent window for not just the adoption, but actually the kind of real stabilisation of demand in that space. Um, we, we'd we had a physio um, business in our pipeline and speaking with a couple of uh, users in that space, you know, a lot of, you know, just very simple demand through, you know, first appointments are all being done digitally, everything's mm -hmm. being recorded digitally, um, you know, advice is then given to customers uh, or patients digitally, you know, and that's kind of sticky, um, both mm -hmm. from a customer perspective, I, it's easier to, to, to have a quick physio appointment on the on your laptop um as well as from a kind of safety perspective so i think the telehealth is um you know, is for sure an area that will be that will have some really interesting um developments i think over the next 18 months um and i think otherwise i kind of echo on the pharma services side i think there's also a lot of digital um innovation that was being quite slow to to um, be adopted and to, to transform and i think as you see a number of the early clinical trials being delayed and they're now looking at the kind of technical solutions to be able to or technology solutions to be able to to um open up that um patient recruitment and starting those trials and the remote monitoring of those patients um, i think there's some super cool services that are, are coming through there and how about david if i may uh, jump in i i am curious to ask the panel the following so i'm currently <clears throat> representing <clears throat> excuse me representing a uh, a software business that plays a role in the uh, supply chain integrity and uh, just by uh, context amazon uh, just announced that it's reinvesting four billion dollars of its uh, gross profits into uh, creating the first virus free uh, supply chain in the world so it's positioning itself as the um, logistics and fulfillment house that is going to ensure the integrity uh, from uh, sourcing point to delivery point to the very last mile, including delivery in the clinic, at the uh, facility, the lab, what have you, or at the, someone's house. What is the panel's view on the uh, increase of businesses that play a role in uh, providing onshore as opposed to Asian Asia based uh, supply chain uh, fulfillment. Should we start um, with uh, Ben on that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, uh, the sort of on onshore versus offshore supply chain integrity thing, I, I I think has been brought front of mind, but I guess historically memories have been quite short in that regard. Um, so I just wonder whether it will be um, something that could reverse on a say five to 10 year basis, which is um, the basis that, on which we, we think about these trends. Um, what I do think is interesting though is um, as population density increases in some of the largest emerging markets, um, there does seem to have been an exponential rise in um, viruses making the crossover from animals to humans. And I can't remember what the number is, but it's something like three new coronaviruses have emerged in the last 20 years. And there was only one in the preceding 100 years or I'm probably getting it wrong. But um, I do think that um, uh, you know, even if they come up with a vaccine for COVID-19, we might get COVID-22 and COVID-25 or, or whatever. And so in, having flex, flexibility to work around that. Um, and also if you're Amazon having a supply chain that can frankly brush it off, I think will be, will be powerful going forwards. Kevin, have you noticed any short-term arrangements or any kind of long-term shifts in terms of supply chain for your businesses? And, and perhaps it's not even a healthcare point, just generally across the portfolio. Yeah, and no, it's an it's an important point, and uh, no, I, I 
Pierre and, and Ben, I think it, it definitely will be an import, increasingly important area. I'd say, you know, we've had the joy of um, sort of preparing for Brexit sort of for some months now and then this. So, you know, we've had two kind of sh significant sort of shocks or imminent sort of shocks to the to the system. And, and one of the first things I think within the businesses that have been thought about by the teams and by us is surety of supply um, of key materials that are going into either from a manufacturing point of view or in um, you know lab based businesses of uh, things that are used there sort of in the services that are provided so uh, I think it's really important and it's sort of one of the things I think that we focused on most early to make sure we didn't have a disruption um, you know as as demand either continued or as it picked up post uh, any event. So may I before we go to Jane Kevin just a follow-up question are you uh, thinking about the supply chain as a a uh, uh, an area of focus for your existing portfolio and or are you looking for supply chain uh, fulfillment or assurity businesses as well to invest in i think well this this the, both i think is probably the answer this uh, the second it probably falls beyond my own sort of personal remit but we're looking we are looking at businesses that are in that world sort of from a services perspective so i think that is an interesting area and obviously there will be some that are healthcare specific as well that are uh, potentially interesting as well. I, I think it will be an interesting area to think about because inevitably post this there will be um, for as much as all businesses probably are prepared there'll probably be some horror stories of things that went wrong and things that weren't able to be accessed during for periods of time so I think it will get increasing attention would be my own view for what it's worth. I guess there, there might be a wider question to explore here beyond the question of supply chain so it, it does feel like um, there has been a, a wider turning inward or, or resistance to some of the, the progress of um, globalization over the last mm -hmm. six months. Um, d does that ring true as a, a phenomenon beyond the lockdown, um, Jane, or, or is, is that um, much more short term in nature? Uh, so it's an interesting question. I think there's definitely, um, I think it will be a medium term change. I think to Ben's point, kind of, you know, initially there is there has been a kind of shift to actually protectionism. So you know, if you're if you're manufacturing PPE, you keep it within your um, borders because it's not seen as politically um, uh, good practice to, to 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 be sending that um, across across borders. Um, I think kind of you know, as you go f forward over the next kind of four years, five years. I think what we will see is a bit of diversification of that supply chain um, as people look to have kind of backup suppliers or kind of you know, slight redundancy within the supply chain. And it all comes back to kind of where's the margin trade-offs and what are people willing to, to take. But I think, you know, if you think about this um, COVID-driven recession has, has driven a kind of, it's been a supply recession rather than a demand recession, if you like, because suddenly supply has been cut off. Um, and I think people will find more creative ways and more uh, you know, diverse, diversify their supply chains in order to be able to maintain supply um, through future, whether it's COVID-22 or, or, or whatever. And that may have an impact in terms of where they source those products from. I know there was an article in The Economist about a month ago suggesting that until wet markets were, were ceased, then you know, mm -hmm. people might try and, um, and cut their... their, their um, their supply chains with China. I'm not sure how practical that is in, in, in real terms. You know, similarly, you know, if you look at where a lot of the other zoonosis has happened, it's bush, um, it's bush meat being consumed in Africa. So um, again, how practical is it to, to cut off a, a supply of people's nutrition? Um, but I think kind of you know, long-winded way of saying I think there will be kind of diversification over the medium term you may see that as people get more complacent again that that kind of consolidates again as people chase margin and try to consolidate their their supply chains but i think there will be some redundancy which will be great for again smaller businesses that are able to be more agile and to be able to um to, be able to kind of capture that demand and you're investing from uh, a quite international funds do you think that um international growth stories in healthcare will be as attractive in the medium term as they have been before COVID? Yeah, I, mean, I kind of have to say this, but yeah, without doubt. Because um, if inf inf inflection does something, it's invest in UK 
typically niche market leaders and um, and help help them internationalize or internationalize further. And that's one of the reasons why we like the, the healthcare space. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I, th I, I think internationalization is sort of here to stay. I suspect that um, a lot will change in the life sciences space as the relationship between China and the US evolves. I think there's, I think there's a supply chain piece around med devices and consumables um which is very relevant right now but long term i think that um a lot of new science will be coming out of china um and it'll be interesting how that sort of rivalry between boston california and shanghai sort of emerges and how the politics works in the background but as as far as we can tell there are healthy life sciences sectors in europe the US and China, which are here to stay. And I would probably also say um, uh, Brazil and, and India, where we also have offices. Um, and I think we will continue find, to find businesses that are doing um, great things and can take advantage of, of the fact that it's a truly global space. Um, if we turn for a moment to care services, which we've not um, quite touched on yet. Um, you know, so much of the growth opportunity and, and the resilience of care services depends on funding outlook where there's a, a state pay dimension. Um, Kevin, you've invested successfully in the past um, in state pay stories. I guess um, from one point of view, the, the recent crisis has focused voters' attention and policymakers' attention on the health sector and the care sector and how those interact. Um, that ought to be positive for funding outlook. Balancing that, or perhaps offsetting that, um, there is a, a, a significantly greater debt burden, or there will be, um, coming out of lockdown than, than was the case previously when austerity seemed to be a thing of the past. Um, how, how do you weigh that balance at the moment? Um, are you able to um, decide which side of the fence you might come down on? It's an interesting question. I mean, in, in recent years, I'd say our skew has been towards uh, businesses that have um, private, se private sector funding. Um, but the backdrop you just described is an interesting one. And I, th I think, you know, what we're all living through, the thought of, um, you know, it will be, I'm sure, you know, looking further forward at a tough time in terms of government spending generally. But again, if you would think if there's one area that's going to be kind of particularly sensitive in terms of certainly cuts but sort of you know even not increases to the extent that people might like it's healthcare. you know if, if you would think of an area that the government actually might trumpet uh where, where uh, funds are being spent you would think healthcare is going to be right up the list so um I, it's an it's an interesting question and um i think you know it's certainly through this period of time people who have broadly been in, investing in many areas of care services um, you know, they, the businesses have been performing well because of the steady income. Um, you know, clearly there's some serious considerations that have been, need to be given to safety and um, patients or residents. Um, but, you know, the best businesses in that world probably have had quite a good time through this, I would think, compared to many. I'm sure that's the case. Um, Jean, do you think the, the crisis has changed the calculus for you around state pay stories? Um, um, I think, you know, we, we try to avoid anything that's got too high, uh, um, too high kind of reliance on public funding, um, as a fund. Um, it's kind of one of our, uh, kind of one of the investment checks, if you like. Um, so for example, we invested in a home care business just before, uh, or just as lockdown happened, but it was exclusively private pay. Ben, um, do you think that um, your uh, focus on um, private pay areas within healthcare will, will change as a result of the crisis? Um, I, I think um, taking a step back, um, it, I mean, it might even be another one of these trends where you have a continuation. I, I, I suspect that you're okay supplying healthcare services or indeed medical devices or pharmaceuticals, as long as you're net net taking cost out of the system, because 
Um, you know, it's been a fact since probably the financial crisis that there isn't enough money in the system to pay for all of the people that need healthcare. And I think if you take the OECD spent healthcare spending per capita of over 65, it's been flat since about 2008. And so what, what I suspect is happening um, in developed markets anyway is things like elective uh, uh, out, outpatient surgery, great way to save money, wonderful market to be in. Um, uh, you know, hospital beds, more difficult. Um, you, need, you need to be supplying whatever it is that you do in the healthcare space, you probably need to be doing something to help take cost out of the system. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I suspect that's probably just more true now, now than ever. Um, there's probably some nuances around what happens to ICU beds um, but versus other capacity in, in hospital. And maybe um, if you take, say, the spa medica transaction, I would assume that Nordic Capital think that ophthalmology, Kevin can probably confirm or deny, but ophthalmology will be something that will probably be taken out of the hospital as they, as they try and increase their ICU capacity for potential future pandemics. But net, net, you've just got to be doing something that makes it cheaper for yep. them. Yep. Yeah, so in that sense, much more continuity than change. Um, taking a step back and thinking about private equities involvement in the healthcare sector. Um, I guess in very buoyant times, um, the discussion around how private equity can add value to a growing business um, is probably a straightforward one. Um, often, I guess you'll be courting vendors who have the option to sell to a, a strategic buyer, um, as well as exploring a P investment. Does the proposition from P for that kind of vendor change in, in terms um, of dislocation to how it was in, in more buoyant times. Um, and perhaps, Jane, you could give your perspective on this. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question. I'd like to believe that uh, P funds can, can kind of help out on a, on a number of fronts. Um, you know, one in the kind of, you know, with existing portfolio companies themselves, from, you know, the immediate firefighting, providing some resource, um, in, in terms of the immediate response to a pandemic and, and supporting staff through with, you know, through to working with um, portfolio companies on cash generation plans, whether it's on, um, you know, deployment of new technology rapidly that's required to be able to overcome kind of physical distancing or, you know, different routes to market, different ways of selling, different ways of getting their product or service to those end customers. Um, and kind of, you know, supporting generally uh, a fairly stretched management team at a time of pandemic in kind of some rapid decision making and, and, and fact finding um, and support. I think kind of, you know, if you think about the kind of the pre-acquisition um, phase as well, I think there's quite a lot that can be done um, with management teams kind of thinking about alternative value creation plans and alternative uh, kind of crafting that more agile strategy with your PE fund that hopefully um, is able to take, you know, take account of different scenarios that might happen in the future, both in terms of um, your kind of demand and how they supply um, and thinking about how you um, kind of course correct to a new normal um, in, in a kind of agile way. So whether that's routes to market, supply chains that we talked about earlier, um, adapting that service or product or, or whatever that offer is um, as the market needs um, evolve and, and change. Um, so I think you know, the, the, the ability to kind of access another, another set of minds that are tapped into an industry um, and that are then able to also access a whole pile of advisors um, behind them that you know, will know that sector extremely well or will know that particular challenge particularly well. Um, all adds to hopefully stronger growth um, and a better exit for everybody. Yep. Thank you. And Kevin, have you and your colleagues had to think differently about how you articulate how private equity can add value to a green business? I don't think so. I mean, there's been two parts to it for us, actually. I mean, initially, sort of the focus, not surprisingly, was on existing investments that we have. And we've done a lot on that front of uh, in bringing different uh, members of the teams together for regular calls uh, with ourselves and with people that we're working with. Advice obviously has been changing, government schemes have been changing quickly. 
Uh, so I think having access for those businesses into someone who can assist with some of the areas where they might be pondering common issues is helpful, hopefully. Um, but I think then looking forward, um, you know, times of dislocation are often a great time to be investing and backing great teams to grow businesses. So I, I think actually looking forward over the coming time, it should be a really exciting time to be making new investments uh, and further investing into existing businesses because there will be businesses that sort of, you know, aren't in as, as robust a position that sort of, you know, or just might have reached a time where they're privately owned and sort of think actually that they might want to do something a bit different. And um, I think that for particularly if it's if the plan involves further M&A, um, that could be could be really interesting. But likewise, I think just as just as much, there could be some really interesting organic opportunities that might be require investment in new areas or new sites or new geographies. So. Ben, how do you see um, private equity adding value to the healthcare sector? through the medium term? Um, I, I think uh, actually the, both Jane and Kevin have really hit the nail on the head in insofar as, um, well, f firstly, a, a lot of what is true now was true before in terms of the support and the help we can provide around business models, people, networks. Um, we have a digital team. We have international offices. We have someone who can help with pricing and route to market and all that, all that good stuff. But as Kevin was saying, I suspect there are probably a lot of entrepreneurs and management teams out there who are thinking, actually, I know quite a few of my competitors who might be thinking, well, this is actually a bit much. Maybe it's time to move on. And there is going to be some acquisition opportunities probably playing out over the next two years. And now might be the right time to, to bring on a partner to help with that. Or, or equally, the sort of dislocation, as Ke Kevin uh, called it, um, might be creating an opportunity for them to enter the US or or Europe or wherever else. So um, I suspect that will be the main nuance as we go through the next kind of year or two is that there will have been a dislocation in the market for whichever business it is. And that will suddenly increase the appeal of taking on a financial partner. Great, thank you. Um, that's really all we have time for in terms of discussion. Um, I'd like to uh, turn over to some questions now from the audience. Um, so one that I would like to pick up, which touches on um, some of our discussions so far. Um, and perhaps, Jane, if I pitch this one to you, how will your approach to due diligence change in the new environment? Ah, good question. Um, so I think kind of there's, you know, we're already modeling different, uh, different range of scenarios. So whereas before the downside case was a one in seven um, recession, <laughs> slightly different, you know, it's a slightly different recession model that <laughs> goes into that, you know, and, and it's you know, around prolonged lockdowns or repeat lockdowns um, and you know, to Ben's point, COVID 2022. Um, so I think there's a there's a range of, of scenarios there, but I think you know there's also kind of practically speaking, can this business um, operate in a lockdown scenario? Can it operate safely um, in a lockdown scenario? You know, has it got large enough facilities to be able to actually physically bring people into either a manufacturing environment, a lab environment, an office environment? Um, can you get a full complement of people in a place that is required? Can they work from home, etc.? So there's a kind of few extra questions that kind of get added to the to the list. But I think the main one is really around that scenario planning um, and the opportunity. You know, it's not just downside. You know, companies that are agile enough to be able to react and respond actually can really um, can really do very well um, out of that. So, so it's kind of you know, it's also an upside. Thank you. Um, Another question from one of our attendees. Uh, do you feel that interest would be heightened for organizations that can demonstrate being pandemic proof? Um, perhaps Ben, if I ask you this one. Uh, well, yeah, and I, I shouldn't say this, but I do think more investors will come into the healthcare space as a result, which is um, obviously net bad for three of us, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but great news for you, I suppose, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I de definitely. I mean, I think the businesses that have just, you know, traded through seamlessly um, will probably command um, more of a premium now. I think particularly if you're doing a transaction in the next six months, um, uh, it, it might be, there might be some scarcity value there. 
Um, and so we'll, we'll probably be far more interested in what this kind of the story is and what, what is it that the entrepreneur or the management team are trying to achieve and why does it make sense for us to be taking part in that and helping out. Um, Thanks. So, yeah, I think that will definitely be the case. Thank you. So that's the first mention of value. Um, we'll come on to valuations in just a second. Just want to remind you about our poll. Let's open the um, the poll functionality on the bottom of the screen so anyone in the audience can take part in this. Fairly predictable question, but keen to gauge the sentiment. Relative to other sectors, will healthcare be more attractive for investment after the lockdown than it was before? Um, so do have a vote and we can pick that up at the end. Um, but going back to you, perhaps, Kevin, um, where do you see valuations playing out, if, if that's not too unfair a question? Do you see a re-rating happening? I, I, generally speaking, I think valuations in healthcare will, uh, for the reasons that you were just discussing, Ben, you were just mentioning, uh, will remain um, strong. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, it, there'll be, um, you know, pockets where it might have been a little bit more difficult, but many, I think, will come back um, quickly. So, David, I, we're looking forward to, you you know, co coining the first EBIT DAC um, <laughs> transaction, which no doubt is going to happen before too long. But, yes, joking aside, I, you know, I'm sure if people can look through and say, right, there has been an impact, but um, it's short-lived. And actually, sort of, the, the, the bounce back sort of has been at least as strong. Um, I think those businesses will likewise be attractive but uh, no, generally speaking I think there's a lot of capital that's looking to, to be invested generally still and I think healthcare will as others have said have an increasing um, proportion of um, new investment. Um, perhaps if I uh, ask Pierre whether he's picked up on um, any initial predictions from his clients or, um, or, or counterparts around valuations in the US? Certainly. Um... Well, I have, I have a, before we go there, I have a comment and an invitation. I think for UK based investors that have portfolio companies that are looking to acquire in the US, now's the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can get comfortable with uh, uh, due diligence at a distance and a meeting at an airport in some sort of a boardroom to have your gut check uh, so you can tell your LPs that you've met face to face with the uh, sellers, Now's the time because I see a lot of um, strategics in a typical process that uh, we will run out of New York. There'll be probably 40 buyers and 30 will be strategics and 10 will be PE. I think there's an opportunity to see an inversion right now. And so because strategics are caught up in their own operations and strategic planning and M&A is important, but it's not their first and foremost thing. So that's my, hopefully that message resonates with all people who invest out of the UK and are looking at what's going on in the US. In terms of valuation, what I've seen in the deals that I'm involved in is 2020 is a write-off, which means that essentially it's admitted between the sellers and the buyer that we are gonna put 2020 sort of in its own little basket, if you will. We're gonna look at trends from 17 to 19, including first quarter of 2020. If there's some sort of structure in the deal where there's an earn out or deferred payments, we're going to look to 2021 and 2022 to achieve that. And we're going to park 2020. So we've been successful to in um, convincing the stakeholders in a deal on the buy side and on the sell side to sort of address this uh, in that fashion. So we're going to look at trends. We're going to look at how you where, how you're trending. But to the extent that there's some sort of a deferred payment or consideration that's on the come, we're going to allow you to sort of start the clock on Jan 1st, 2021. And people have been comfortable with that. Gene, multiple, just a one, one last comment. In terms of multiple, yeah. I agree with Kevin. I see, you know, tremendous uh, bids being made even as we speak. So I don't see a downward pressure on the multiples. Gene, is that uh, um, a picture that you'd expect to see? Do you think that's how things are likely to, to be for the medium term? Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, there's kind of two sectors that have demonstrated themselves as being core and necessary throughout COVID, uh, you know, healthcare and food supply. Um, and, you know, so to Ben's point, I think, unfortunately, there will be more people coming into the sector from a PE perspective um, to invest. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, um, we, uh, 
uh, it's not great news for us, but it's great news for everyone picking their business up <laughs> and looking for investment. Um, so, so, yeah. Um, a question from our audience, and perhaps Ben, given your um, funds track record, this might be uh, one that I can pitch to you. Um, how do you assess the investment landscape for buy and build consolidators of consumer healthcare services, especially when some of those services are of a more discretionary nature? So this was a big opportunity and a big priority for funds pre-COVID. Is that still yeah. going to be the case as we go into new normal? Um, it, so our, our thesis at Inflection, being honest, is that it'll, there'll be, it will be kind of late recovery rather than rebound. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm talking about sort of aesthetics and dentistry and that kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, um, that's probably peak dislocation mm -hmm. in the healthcare sector. Um, so whilst we were probably less interested it, in it before COVID-19, because um, the valuations placed on the consolidators were extremely high, um, and actually, the prices paid for some of the acquisitions being made by those consolidators were pretty high. Um, now you could see a reversal of that because, I mean, we're we're sort of we 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 we're investors in a, a um, chain of vet clinics, and we're an investor in a chain of uh, travel vaccination businesses that are both kind of seeing that trend. Actually, that there are some people, some independents who are kind of we're sticking it out mm. and now kind of thinking actually maybe now's the time to sell up which sort of suggests that there might be the kind of opportunity that kevin referred to earlier yeah yeah um question for you kevin which has been asked in two or three different ways by different participants um so i'm going to kind of aggregate those how difficult do you think debt markets are likely to be and do you see your fund focusing away from deals that need high leverage to make them work so to answer, to answer the latter question, I think, yes, generally speaking, we, we will. I mean, we, we, what's important to us, I think, when we look at debt is um, when, when we use it, and we don't always have debt in transactions uh, when we make investments. But uh, when, when we do, uh, you know, the most important consideration is the flexibility to grow. Uh, and there are a number of debt providers, I think, who are, who are thoughtful on that front. And, and um, I think hopefully we'll continue to be looking forward uh, in providing facilities to help companies to expand either organically or through further acquisitions if it's relevant. Um, so that's certainly how we're thinking about it. But I think thinking about the structure of those debt packages looking forward uh, is going to be even, well, it's always important. It's going to be even more important looking forward just to make sure that you don't um, handcuff the flexibility of companies. Thanks. Um, I think perhaps time for one more question before we wrap up. Um, and this goes back to some of our discussion around virtual deal making. Uh, Jane, if I may ask you, would you make an investment without having physically met the management team? Oh, it's hard. Uh, <laughs> I think we would try everything we possibly could in order to actually meet the management team. Um, you know, I think we've all said kind of earlier, it's really important to, you know, to, to kind of start that journey with a management together team together um, I know um, I know we've been trying to get get our paws on various bits of PPE which allows kind of a little bit more <laughs> um, physical um, contact but obviously travel you know one of the things that's fairly advanced in our pipeline moment is in, in America so you know God knows when we'll actually be allowed to physically go to the US um, so watch this space it may well happen <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to close the polling. So uh, that is almost unanimous um, with a pretty good sample, actually. So the question was to remind you, relative to other sectors, will healthcare be more attractive for investment after the lockdown than it was before? So um, after, after a good number of votes, the results are 95% yes, 5% no. So a, a thumping really... endorsement of the, the consensus <laughs> of the panel. There we go. Um, excellent. Well, uh, I want to 
stop there. Um, thank you very much, audience members, for your involvement. I, I do hope that you found that useful. Um, and do look out for a follow-up email, which will have a recording of this webinar, um, but also a link to the, the virtual deal-making paper um, that we produced and that we, we talked about earlier. Um, particular and effusive thanks to our, our panelists for being so generous with their time uh, and with their insights today. Um, and one final thought. Um, we do understand that our clients are, are wrestling right now with a lot of challenge and a lot of change. Um, but do think of us at Results Healthcare as being here to help. Um, if it'd be useful to have a thought partner to work through an issue or an opportunity, please do get in touch. It'd be, it'd be great to hear from you. So um, until we speak again, keep well. Bye-bye.